Hey there, listeners. Welcome to another wonderful episode of the Leadership is Changing podcast. My name is Dennis Giannoutsos, and I'm your host. I had a great interview with a gentleman by the name of Ryan Staley. Now, Ryan is the founder and CEO of an organization called Whale Boss, and he's grown a business unit from zero to $30 million of uh, annual revenue and so forth. And he did that with a very small sales team, but he's also been recognized as the top AI thought leader for revenue growth. He has a podcast, and the podcast is called The Scale Up Show. And you want to check out that podcast as well. Ryan and I talked about various things. One was how to integrate AI into the workforce. In fact, how do you make a super human workforce? Transformative period in leadership right now is what he was talking about. But we also talked about that his biggest successes came out of failures. And it was a brilliant discussion. So sit back and enjoy. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Hey there, listeners. Welcome to another wonderful episode of the Leadership is Changing podcast. Great to have you here with us today. I've got an awesome guest with me. His name is Ryan Staley. Ryan, a massive welcome to you. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Happy to be on the show. Looking forward to it. And uh, it's going to be fun, man. Excellent. Now, for our listeners' sake, whereabouts are you in the world today? I am straight west of Chicago out of Illinois, in in the States, obviously. So that's where I'm from, man. Grew up south of the city in the burbs, lived in the city, and then got domesticated with kids and a dog and moved back out to the suburbs. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Chicago, I love it. It's a, it's a nice place. My brother and his wife and kids were living there for about four years because we grew up in the coffee industry. And so he uh, started his own brand called Mojo Coffee. And there's, I think, three cafes within the city. So in South Wack, is that the right way of saying that street? Yeah. Yeah. So wait, that's your brother-in-law? That's my brother. Your bro- Dude, I love Mojo Coffee. So oh. we, we did not plan this for listeners, but that was in the building that I worked in, and that was my go-to coffee place. And I was just talking about the other day. I'm like, man, I wish they had one of those Mojo Coffees out in the suburbs because I went there every day. Best cappuccino in the world. Highly recommended. You ever go to Chicago, go grab one. 200 South Wacker. Big, really cool place. Yeah, so, excellent. Uh, yeah. And you know that you can actually have the coffee delivered to you, like if you do sort of plunger coffee and things like that. I know it's not a cappuccino, but, um, or even beans, you can actually have it delivered to you. But you and I can talk about that offline later. But anyone else in the US listening, you can actually have it. But reach out to me and I can sort of give you the link and all that stuff too. But uh, maybe I should say to my Love brother, it. hey, you just sponsored this episode, mate. <laughs> so it's all good. Hey, um, Ryan, we, I've given the listeners a little bit of an introduction to you, but we'd love to hear more about your background. I understand that you're the founder and CEO of Whale Boss. Tell us more about what you've done, where you've come from, but also what you do today. Sure, yeah. So effectively, like I kind of mentioned, I grew up in the lower middle income, blue collar type environment. I mean, my mom was a teacher, my dad was a police officer, and they really instilled that Midwest hard work ethic into me, right? So Started like my earliest jobs when I was delivering papers and a bus boy. And then, you know, had one of my first sales jobs selling shoes effectively, like Al Bundy on that old show, Married with Children, right? And so anyways, long story short, I progressed there, started out of sale or started into sales right out of school with like a hundred percent basically commission job. I got a $1,500 draw and started off there. I love getting for performance because I saw my parents work their butts off their entire life and only get incremental increases or elevations. And then so from there, I moved up the chain in terms of an individual contributor and then basically progressed into leadership. Within leadership, you know, I ran a revenue team mid-market. Then I was tasked to, I turned that around. It was underperforming, doing really bad. And then was tasked to start an enterprise team, grew that from zero to 30 million in ARR in five and a half years with four salespeople. From there, I left and basically started helping companies deploy those revenue systems in their business. And then fast forward, it was about three and a half years ago, 15 months ago, I got infatuated with 
the use of AI and growing a company because, you know, one of the things I always had to do, I was never like in a company that had tons of resources. I was never for a venture back company or anything. So I always had to get scrappy and creative in terms of how to get results. And so once I saw AI democratize, I'm like, oh, this is the next level, right? And so now I'm helping companies basically integrate AI into their people so they can create almost like a superhuman workforce to 2X their output and even give them back 10 hours plus a week. So that's what we want to focus on today. That's my history. And I've had lots of bumps and bruises and excitement along the way with all that, but it was a great journey, man. And we're still pushing forward. Excellent. And in the name Whale Boss, where, where's that come from? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'm actually in the process of considering, like, do I rebrand my company name? Because when I first started, my core focus was on that enterprise sales motion. And so, you know, the whole idea is you want to get more whales in the sales vernacular, right? Since so you always want to get the biggest ones. And so that's where Whale Boss came in <laughs> because folks were always like asking me, like, how did I achieve those results with the team, a really small team? And I'm like, we just systematically replicated and increased the size of our whales. And so that's kind of how it came about. Yeah, very good. That's an interesting concept and a thought, you know, it's really quite good, but it stands out. It's different than just sort of your the other kind of names, a lot of them out there, which is, I find sometimes are quite boring, but that's different. And uh, yeah, it's nice. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got a podcast as well. Yes, I do. It's called the scale up show. And so I've been interviewing tech CEOs on there, specifically AI founders, and then I share, you know, tips, tricks, and insights in terms of integrating AI into work. Because I believe it's one of those things that's only going to happen once in our lifetime and it's happening so fast. So the more I could give back with what I'm learning to people, then that's what I get excited about. Yeah. And we're hearing about AI all the time. You know, just a few years ago, there was the buzzword about cloud computing and things like that, right? It was a buzzword. Now it's AI. Leaders today, how much should they be getting investing into AI? How much knowledge should they know? Should they become AI savvy or is just something that's going to pass as well? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, well, I don't think, I know this is not going to just pass and be a trend just because the results that you're seeing have never been seen with anything at this scale before this fast. And so what, if I'm a leader and here's the thing, Dennis, I'm starting to present to executive groups first or executive teams because they don't even know how to use it. Right. And so kind of the way I approach it is when I say AI, let me be clear on what I'm talking about, because there's 40 different variations or 4,000 variations of what AI could actually mean. What I'm talking about is integrating AI into your work. And so that could be ChatGPT, that could be Microsoft Copilot, that could be Gemini, right? And so what's happening is all these products are now available and are starting to get into PowerPoint, Excel, Word, if you're on the Microsoft side or Google Workspace on the, the Microsoft side, right? However, like most people are looking at this as just a productivity play. What happened with the internet, the, the internet was transformative as well. But they're looking at that. Whereas where I'm seeing things differently is like for the first times in our lives, I'll give you a real world example. I assume you have, you know, since there's so many leaders on here, I assume most folks are pretty, pretty passionate about learning, right? And so one of the, or reading books, right? And so one of the things that, that I did the other day, I actually did this while I was shaving, right? Not, it was not TMI, but took a total of 12 minutes. And, you know, one of the things I'm working on for my business is creating more systems. So I never had a chance to read the ebook revisited or e myth revisited, I should say, not ebook, e myth revisited. So I said, okay, I put on the voice app for ChatGPT and I said, effectively, I want you to summarize the entire book in two pages, identifying the key points with examples on how to do that. And basically, it read it off to me, right? So I used the voice app with the, the verbal capability, read it off to me. And then I said, okay, this is the stage of business that I'm at. These are my goals and this is what I accomplished. Now, customize a recommendation based on that book for my business specific to that. Then it gave me a recommendation of exactly how to execute the book or the learnings from the author that took 20 years to learn, right? Then the last and final step is I said, okay, now create actual worksheets or checklists on how I could execute that for your recommendation. And then boom, it gave me that as well. So literally in 12 minutes, I took a book, had it, you know, 20 years of knowledge, whatever it took to get there, right? Had it customized to me and my business. And then I actually had the implementation tools to do that. And that all happened in 12 minutes, effectively for free. Hmm. So that's one microcosm of what's possible. And then you talk about work and there's a million other use cases we could talk to, but that's what gets me really excited about it. And that is very cool. I mean, I like it. 12 minutes, bang, there it is. Didn't even stop for any red lights. Just keep going. What's really quite interesting is the fact that you 
customized it for you. And that's the beautiful thing about it. I think there's a lot of learning out there, a lot of workshops, a lot of books and things like that. People go, okay, it's very generic, but what does it mean for me? And I think just the fact that you did that is really good. Then in turn, if I think about leaders and I think about organizations, it's about using those tools to customize things for the organization or for where they're going. You know, I think there's a lot of people out there afraid that it's going to take over jobs and things like that. Well, that's what's happened in many things in life, even from the cassette tape to the DVD and then to other areas. People were scared of that DVD and or CDs, as I should say, in those days. I think the big thing here is how do you drive it? That's where this is the tool. It's about what you just used, shared with us as an example of telling ChatGPT or asking ChatGPT to really drive this what you're wanting to get the outcome or the result you wanted, which is very good to see. Thanks. And Dennis, here's the thing. You just mentioned the team and you, you gave me an idea. So if I wanted to use that for my team and say I was a CEO or an executive, I could specifically say, okay, now help me implement, you know, the email three visited for my team in marketing. You know, what would you recommend in marketing? And then it would give you that specific and then you can deploy that to your team, right? Yeah. The other thing on the team side that I think is a big opportunity is creating like almost like a centralized AI innovation hub for your team where you have like prompts and use cases. So then what'll happen is you can leverage the best of the best that your best people create. And then other people start to innovate on top of those. And that's when it gets really powerful. And most people aren't doing that. They're just kind of like letting their employees like do it haphazardly, unorganized and uncontrolled. Mm. And I think if you put a little bit of structure and guidance around it, you could start to get the, those exponential results. And that, that's kind of what gets me excited as well. Yeah. And I think you, I love what you said before, but it becomes a superhuman workforce. It's a workforce that's going to be really be able to go to different levels. Excellent. I'm, ex I'm excited by AI as well. In fact, I'm excited about a lot of these tools out there coming from a tech background and so forth. Now, you mentioned before about getting into leadership. So the question is, how did you actually get into that leadership role? Yeah, well, it's really interesting, man, because both of my biggest successes, specifically in leadership, came right after my biggest failures. Hmm. Okay. And so, so the first one, let's say how I got into leadership, which is a great question. <clears throat> it was interesting. So always through my career, like prior to a point, I think prior to starting my first leadership role, I guess I, I did start a leadership role like two and a half years out of school, but was only in it for about a year and a half. So I technically don't count it, but it was a leadership role. So let's talk about what you're saying. My first like longer tenured leadership goal, right? Or roles where I was there for nine and a half years. That's much longer, right? Mm. And so the first one came after I got effectively fired or let go from a company that basically hired me to start at Enterprise Motion, which is, is kind of funny. I was at the rep level then and they're like, hey, we want to do this. And, you know, they were looking at doing deals that were 200, 300, 500 K. There was no design, go to market or anything. And effectively, like there, we didn't get any deals closed in nine months from a cold start. And they're like, well, why aren't more deals closed? You know what I mean? Like your pipeline looks good, but why aren't more deals closed? So there was a gap in terms of leadership understanding like, what it takes and what kind of a commitment it is to get that flywheel moving. Yeah. So that was step one. And so then shortly after that, I, it's funny, someone who worked with me prior, liked what I did. And he reached out to me cold after that happened. And he says, Hey, you know, we're looking for a leader in this role. Would you be interested? And so then I interviewed with, I ended up taking a leadership role and then was tasked to turn around an underperforming office. And so that's how it got started. And, and then to fast forward, you know, what happened was it was the first time where I was in a, I guess I've always been a really demanding environment, but it was the first time where no matter kind of what happened, I was always getting pressed to do more, right? And so, which is, it's good to get pressed, but sometimes you have to look at the realization of, you know, what's possible, right? Not just what's that, what you want, but what's like a, a systematic way to do it. And so what happened there was basically, I was getting pressed from the leadership, you know, the CEO, and then I was getting pressed from my team because I was pushing them really hard. So I was kind of in that shit sandwich, you know, in the middle of the shit sandwich, if you will, or the shit sandwich. Maybe I was the shit sandwich. Mm. And so I started to like work 60, 70 hours a week, abandoned any personal time. And it really started to, to wear on me and my relationships emotionally. And so I was not fun to work for. I was a jerk, right? Because it was just crabby. However, we were getting results. And so then I got demoted 
technically and said, hey, we're taking your team away from you, but you're really good at enterprise sales. So we want you to start this from scratch. And then that's when I grew it from zero to 30. And so it's just kind of wild how these things happen because, you know, sometimes your biggest mistakes or your biggest losses perceived by your employer tend to, you know, be the precursor to the big result. So, yeah. And I think that's a great point that you're bringing up because there may be listeners listening to this episode right now who are going through a period of time where it's not going too well for them. But I think those times are the times that you make a decision or you go and do something else and then you take off and fly, which is brilliant to see. The 60, 70 hours a week, I see a lot of leaders like this, right? And it's about, you know, that old terminology out there. It's not about working hard. It's about working smarter, right? And I think that's where the AI tools and so forth, the systems and the processes will allow us to work smarter. Yeah, very good. I like what you said before about the biggest success in leadership came out of my failures. I think that's very strong in thinking about that. Now, the question I've got for you here is this person could be alive or from history, because from a lot of us, we will learn from various people, various leaders. Who's been your favorite leader and why? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And if I'm looking at my favorite leader in history, it's funny because I would say the one that's had the biggest impact on me as a whole person is probably Tony Robbins, Hmm. which the reason being is like, I just like growing up and I mean, I grew up in the eighties, right? You know, so growing up in the eighties was different, (laughs) you know what I mean? And it was just, just be a man, tough it out, Hmm. make it happen, you know? So very hard, not really hard line approach, but it's just the way it was back then. Right. And, And there's a lot of awesome things about that environment and grit that it builds into you and that it internalizes into you. However, one of the things that was never a part of that growing up phase in the 80s and 90s was effectively the fact of like personal development wasn't as big as it was then. And so there was a lot of other parts. It was always like work hard, make money, do stuff with your family. That's it, right? It wasn't really about the whole person of you and, and what it takes Also, nutrition and biohacking wasn't taking place then. So I think what happened with him, like I used to, Tom Bilyeu was somebody that I was really impressed with too from Quest Nutrition. And they really were big into that personal development journey that I had that helped me reshape my purse myself and build myself from the inside out to be a better version of myself through the fact of resiliency and looking at life in different ways besides just success in business, right? Mm. And so I think that was probably the biggest level of impact I had from him. I went to some of his events, got recommended from a a client that was the CEO of a Fortune 1000 company because he went and checked it out. It was one of the best things I've ever done in my life. So yeah, that's great. Do you know what? I think what you just said before about, you know, we've got the job, we've doing, we've got, you know, family, car, house, things like that. And that was just about it. For a lot of people that those days used to get told, hey, you've got a job, just be grateful. And you're like, so I think, no. I mean, yes, you've got a job and it's all very nice. But I think the thing is, if you're unhappy in that job or you're not doing well in that job or you could be doing something else and you could be a a star in the other thing that you could do, why wouldn't you go and do that other thing? I think for a lot of people, there's that fear of leaving their job or even going to do another bigger role in another organization. Because if you're someone like yourself doing 60, 70 hours already in that current role, how can you go off and do a bigger role? I'm not going to do a hundred hour a week. I can't even cope with today's role. So I think it's, so true. Yeah, it's just so yeah. interesting. So I think a lot of it comes down to that development and helping you understand and to be able to cope, but also lead going forward, which is important. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Hey, if you and Tony Robbins were to sit on a park bench having a coffee, just you and him, one-on-one, would there be a question that Ryan would love to ask Tony? Uh, I'm sure there's a hundred questions I'd like to ask sure. him, right? I don't have a anything planned or anything like that as of now. However, I guess, you know, I've listened to so much of his content too. So I have an understanding of like his thoughts on different issues. The one thing that I haven't unlocked completely from him is, I mean, he, I don't know if you know this, but he's been a coach for some of the biggest business leaders in the world. Right. And so I think it would be great to get his customized recommendations for the stage of business I'm at and what to do. Cause I'm sure there's limiting beliefs or other things like that that are my blind spots. You know what I mean? So it'd be good to surface those, have him deconstruct those and then identify, you know, based on who I am, what I've done and 
current skill set and resources that I have, how to be the most resourceful possible, resourceful, I should say, how to be the most resourceful leader possible, right? And, and I think that's probably kind of the way I would approach it with him. So, so there's the thing that I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure AI can do, right? So could AI look at Tony Robbins's presentations, his events, his books, and then say, customize something for you where, and you're, where you're at with what your blind spots are? Because I don't think AI would be able to pick that up. That's, that, I don't know, am I right in saying that? Or what, do, what are your thoughts there? You probably can. It would just take some very involved prompting. And like, for example, with GPTs, you can create a GPT, which is basically like an assistant, right? And you could do it through natural language, just like typing. And you can train it on his content. You know what I mean? So I just know with some of the the things that I'm talking about on the business side, that's not stuff that's out there, no. right? That's not stuff that, that he only reveals it in his live events, right? So you don't have access to that, maybe a little bit tougher, but you know, there are definitely ways where you could leverage it. And it's a, a good call out as potentially use case. Cause I've done that with before with Steve Jobs. He's not even around, right? <laughs> I've done that with Elon Musk. I've created a board of directors of some of the top business leaders in the world and gotten their opinions based on their expertise. So yeah, I think you could without a doubt do it with someone like Tony Robbins. I just wonder if the training data that we're talking about it would be out there in public or not. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there'd be things that he actually holds back. I do that myself. There's things that I don't share on the podcast or when I'm talking with people fully. There'll be times where but people are into the workshops and those events. That's when I'll share it, you know, a lot more, but then sort of start to target on an individual people as well. Very good. Now, the title of the show is called Leadership is Changing. When I talk about that title, that statement, what does it mean for Ryan? Well, it is changing. I mean, by the simple fact of the physical nature of the way the office environments change, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we used to all be, I, I don't know, the bulk of people would be in the office and that's not the case anymore, right? Most people are remote or at least I think it's 50% when you last checked it, at least in the States. Is that is that where the percentage is? Is it about 50, would you say? Or Yeah, I think so. Well, I think it could be even 60, 40, but yeah, you're right. I think it's getting very close to the 50, 50. But then there's organizations that are purely just at home. There are organizations that are now back in the office, but there's a lot that are the hybrid kind of model, whereby you might be 60% of your week in the office and 40% at home, or 40% in the office and 60% home. Okay. So yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking roughly around that. So, I mean, that's a whole new different layer. And so at the same time, freelance work or multi-job capability is more accessible than ever as well. So I think there's a couple of things happening and it sometimes it's, I mean, and I've seen this and I've had CEOs tell me this where they've had people on their staff that have three jobs, three full-time jobs. Yeah, I've had other people try that as well. And so I think Here's kind of the way I look at it. And, and there's other people that have it, right? So it's, I think the, the key element is like you manage people by outcomes and KPIs when it comes to remote work, because then it's, it takes the micromanagement aspect out of it, right? Now, I'm sure there's always an element of that, but if you're trying to lead, you can lead and inspire. However, at the same time, there's got to be a mechanism to help hold people accountable. And so I think if you have those KPIs to help lead as a guiding metric, as well as the vision and the why of the company, then that's something that is a, is a totally different way of leading that most people didn't have to do before because they could physically see people all the time in real life. Yeah. You know, so I think that's how leadership's changing and the biggest aspect. And a lot of people struggle with it. The good thing is, or the fortunate thing for me is I've always had to manage sales reps by KPIs. And so now I'm just like, when I look at folks that I'm leading or managing is also infusing those principles of the same way I manage them because they had a lot of autonomy to be outside of the office as well. Yeah. Actually, my Uber driver the other day, I was going to, to an event to do and he picked me up at 7 a.m. I think. Yeah, dropped me off about 7.25 a.m. And he was off to go and do another couple more jobs, go home and then log on to do his full-time job as a software or system software tester. And he works from 8.30 through to 5.00. And then he logs off and then he's back in the car by 5.15, 5.30 and he works through to about eight o'clock and does that. So he does Uber and he does his full-time job too. And it's like, wow. And thinks it's fantastic for him. He's really loving it, right? And yeah, so. Good for him. That's, I mean, that's a hell of a work ethic if yeah. he's working that many hours. And so if he enjoys it, then power to him. Yeah, absolutely. Now, 
you and I are seeing a world where it seems to be getting faster. Technology and even just the fact that AI and, and how it's making things and helping things go faster. Technology, data, social perspective from business, everything seems to get faster. What's going to help a leader today be successful in that fast-paced, ever-changing world? What's your thoughts on that? You know, it's funny because I saw there was a poll about this, and I'm trying to remember where the heck I saw it, about the most critical resource or the most critical skills or capabilities that a leader must have today. And I think the number one like that was voted, and I can't remember how many, but it was a pretty big sample size, was adaptability. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah, because, I mean, we've gone through the fastest rate of change in terms of business that we've ever seen in our entire lives. And that's, I, I don't think it's going to slow down, right? So it's, if you're not adaptable and you're not flexible and anti-fragile, then it's going to be really hard to survive because there's massive edges to those that are aware of those. And, you know, like specifically with technology, they've never been there before all the way to the point where, and I'll give you a real world example of this, but like, I've taught my kids how to leverage like an, like one single AI tool, right? For 15 minutes. And they now have the capability to perform at the level of an expert graphic designer. So, and these are 13 and 11 year olds, Amazing. Dennis, right? So if that could be done for a 13 year old, I mean, what do you think other people could do too, right? And so, however, what I would also say is focus. So it's adaptability, but like discipline focus, right? And so I know you said, you know, what's the most important? I think align those two together and maybe we can combine them into one word. So I'm being compliant with your answer. But basically that's, I think the area because, because there's so many options, people get paralyzed and they don't know what to do then, right? Yeah. So it's being adaptable, but not being frozen because of the, you know, the mountain of choices that they have. Yeah. And I don't think it, here it is. I don't think it's a fad, F-A-D of just focus, adaptability and discipline. It's something that needs to happen and it's going to continue to happen for leaders as well. There you go, fad. There's a name, there's a little word. Yeah. I was going to say DAF, but didn't think it would go too well. ADF, maybe. But uh, yeah, fad is, could be a word. In, anyhow, it's interesting to see. Adaptability, discipline, I like it as well. I'll even add another word in there too. It's the fourth one, which is around consistency. And so we can be adaptable, disciplined, and focus on a consistent basis. Wow. Imagine where your leadership, imagine where your business could be in the next six months to 12 months from now as well. Mm. So true. Ron, yeah. Ryan, you and I have been talking uh, about things of, of around leadership and business and AI and so forth through the lens of a leader. If we think about the employees today, right? You and I have both been employees in the past. You may have employees working for us today as well. So employees' expectations of leaders, has that changed? It's a good question. I think if we're thinking about the, yeah, I, I think it has a lot. I mean, what do you think? I think so. You interview leaders all the time. Yeah, and most of them do say, yes, it has. And expectations of leaders have changed in the sense that they are looking for more that vulnerable, authentic, real, transparent kind of leader. But I think a lot of them are actually, what's quite interesting is the generations. People think that a lot of the younger generations are quite entitled or they're looking to be the CEO tomorrow. They're not. What they're actually looking for is actually looking for strong leadership, which is a different way of looking mm -hmm. at it because. If they go into an organization and they see leadership that's not strong, it's weak, they go, see you later. I want someone to show me, mentor me, and lead me of something that I want to do that's got purpose and value. And uh, that's what they're looking for. So I think that's what's changing a lot more, and they're calling it out more, and they're looking out for it more. You seeing that yourself? Yeah, I see that. I think, you know, I've heard both sides of it, right? And yeah. I, I don't like to paint broad brushes when it comes to, oh, everybody younger today is so entitled, right? Or millennials, you know, there's a big thing on millennials for a while. But what I've heard from other leaders pretty consistently is that the younger generation will push back really hard on things when they haven't even demonstrated value yet. And, and that's one thing that is really interesting to me because it's changing, I guarantee, because the the shift, it used to be, you know, re recently, the employee had all the power, mm -hmm. right? Because there was so many jobs and not enough employees. And now it's kind of shifting, right? Back to the employer. So there's always going to be kind of that seesaw battle of, you know, who has the upper hand or the leverage at the same time. I think one of the things that I made the mistake on younger in my career is I was always looking at, okay, did I, for the effort, 
that I put in, was I getting equi equitably compensated for it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the one factor that I missed with that, it, there's two factors. One, sometimes you'll work your butt off and the value you create for the company isn't worth the amount of money that you should receive, right? And, and that's one of the things I think younger people don't understand is in order for you to be a valuable employee, you have to create value for the company, not just do your job, yep. right? And, and that, that's what a lot of people miss. And I made that mistake when I was younger too, so I could speak from experience. And if you do that, you have a chance to elevate yourself significantly if you're always looking at you know value to the company, value to my boss, value to me, right? If you have that trifecta wrapped together, then you're going to get escalated really high in a leadership position and have a lot of opportunities open up to you. Yeah. That's just my two cents on that. No, I like it. The, the value trifecta, I think it is, and it's right. And yeah, so, and I think that's part of your brand. That's the way you, you get known for as an individual, as a leader as well, and the way you show up and the way you do things, which is good. If I was to get you to get your crystal ball out now and think about the future, where do you see yourself being, or yourself, where do you see leadership being in five years from now? Yeah, um, I think so. What, so that'd be 2029. Here's the thing, man. I think we're going to be hitting our artificial general intelligence at that point. And so you're going to have, it's not going to be just managing people or leading people. It's also going to be managing and leading systems and workflows more heavily than people do now. Mm. And so what I mean by that is we're going to have effectively augmented people to do their jobs, but then we're going to have like standalone AI agents that could do work as well. So it's a combination of integrating all that together and being yeah. strong emotionally and mentally for the people side of it, but then being technical and, and innovative on the other side for the system side of it. So I think those are going to be table stakes. I don't think that's going to be like a top leader. Those are table stakes. And the ones that do it the best we'll be able to truly marry those two together in a, in a harmonious way that creates really good results. Hmm. A beautiful way to bring this to an end as well, Ryan. That's a great way of summing it up. So if our listeners wanted to get hold of you, Ryan, where should they go? Yeah, so I think like I publish content pretty much actually sometimes twice a day on LinkedIn. And then my website is ryanstaley.io. You can see basically I have a lot of content and, and value that it's for free. You can check out. And then you can get in contact with me there. Just fill out the contact form if, if you're interested in having me help you or you know, connect to me on LinkedIn and just mention, hey, you saw me on the show. Great. What we'll do is we'll put that in the show notes there, listeners. Uh, but Ryan, once again, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been real cool uh, talking to you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me on, man. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, excellent. There you go, listeners. Well, it's a transformative period in leadership right now. The biggest success in leadership comes after failure at times. Remember, being an adaptive leader is a very big thing to think about today and a skill that's needed, but also along with being disciplined and focused. Hey, thanks for joining us. It's always a pleasure. Until next time, bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast-moving world.